Father God, we thank you for allowing us to see another day and giving us everything that we needed to make it through yesterday. Father God, we're holding on to your promises while trying our best to stay in the line with your will. You know what we need. You know what needs to be done in every individual situation. And only you know, Father God, how to do it. Dear Master God, we are claiming the victory over everything in our lives and the lives of those close to us that the enemy has tried to destroy. Dear Master God, we thank you for giving us understanding, giving us comfort, and showing us who you are right just when we need you. And we need you now, Heavenly Father. Stand me up. Speak through me to your people that we may hear a word from heaven. And we'll be so glad, so proud to give you all the praise and give you all the glory because you're worthy to be praised. Please, Heavenly Father, Continue to work with me. Continue to work with each one of our hearts in, in the right place. And we will continue to surrender to you. Father God, we thank you and we love you. This prayer we pray is in your darling son Jesus' name. I will save you, your son, with thanksgiving in our heart. Amen. I want to say good morning to all that I haven't spoken to. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We solicit your prayers every time we stand behind this sacred desk. Even if we're not behind this sacred desk, we, we need your prayers. John chapter 11, verse 1 through 5. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ornament and wiped his feet with her hair, who brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister said unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. In your spare time, I, I would like to ask you to read the rest of that, down, at least down to verse 15. But for the sake of time, we just read those first five verses. But I would like to talk to you from the topic. The one you love is sick. The one you love is sick. I imagine that some have already settled in this morning ready to hear another sermon on Lazarus. But I want to caution you and encourage you to stay, stay with me this morning. We will get through this. This will not be one of your traditional sermons on what we understand about the death of Lazarus. But I want to focus strong this morning on just a practical application. If the scripture don't become alive for us and we find a relevant message, it is to no avail. You see, this chapter 11 enters upon a special home in the town of Bethany in Palestine. The name Bethany means house of dates. This was a special place and home for several reasons. It was special because Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus, they lived there. These were two sisters and a brother who knew and loved the Lord Jesus Christ. Their hearts was open to Jesus, and so were their home. Since there was no Motel 6 to leave the light on in that day, 
the travelers depend upon the hospitality of the local people to receive them into their home and help them along the way. But this home was always open to Jesus. And he would often stop, rest, and eat there. This home was special because it was filled with the love of God. Jesus was also welcome there. This was a place of rest, and it was a place of refuge for the Savior during his earthly pilgrimage. In verse 2, John mentions one example as evidence of love in that home. He said it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ornament and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. In verse 1, we read that the news came to Jesus and, and his disciples informing him that Lazarus was sick. The disciples were all too aware of the attachment Jesus had with this particular home and especially Lazarus. But upon receiving the news, the disciples began to anticipate the Savior's response. As we look at verse 3, it says, Therefore, his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, he whom thou lovest is sick. Mary and Martha did not give instruction for Jesus to come to their aid. That would be unnecessary. Surely, he would come with haste. After all, Jesus loved Lazarus. Jesus would rush right over to Bethany and, and, and render aid to, to his friend Lazarus. Or so everyone thought. Mary and Martha would not have sent word of their brother's condition. But help me, Holy Spirit. And somehow, these sisters in a distressed frame of mind were able to, to send a message to Jesus. Have y'all ever tried sending a message to Jesus? Help me, Holy Spirit. And the message is absolutely beautiful. It's just, it's just loaded with truth. Listen to it in verse 3. Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And you can almost catch that flavor. The word behold could be translated, listen. Listen, Lord. The one whom you love is sick. It's a tender, humble, beautiful, simple message. There is no medical diagnosis here. Lord Lazarus has compound whatever of the whatever. It doesn't say that at all. It doesn't say, Lord, here's the problem. Now, we've got to do something, Lord. Now, I don't even ask him to do a thing. Did you look at it again? It doesn't even ask the Lord to do anything. It just says, Lord, listen. The one you love is sick. That's all. It doesn't tell him what to do. It's a surrender of love. It just says, Lord, here's a need. And that's all it says. It doesn't even say his name is Lazarus. But the Lord knew because he knew who he loved. There was no problem there. It was, it has a lovely humility. I like it because there aren't any instruction in it. How do you talk to God? God, oh, I have a need. Now let me tell you how to work it out. See, God, if you just do this, if you just do that and make him do this or make her do that, you don't need to do that. Lord, here's a need. Give it to him. That's it. That's all it takes. You don't have to say, God, here's my need. Now let's work on the solution. They didn't do that. They just said, here's a need, Lord. That is the surrender of love. Here's my need. There it is. Lord, I'm just going to leave it with you. That's it. That's really good. That's all it takes. It is at this juncture, this point of time, that the 
narratives take an interesting turn. Jesus did not do what his disciples and loved ones anticipated him to do. As a matter of fact, I would suggest to you that, that they were bewildered by his response. You see, the action of attitude of the Savior wasn't that they had anticipated. If we were honest, we would admit that there are times in our lives when we are bewildered by God. We are perplexed, my brothers and sisters, by what he is going to do or what he is doing in our lives and in the lives of others. One of the most difficult things we have to help as Christians is what to do when God does not do what we have been taught to expect him to do. Let's just be honest this morning. We act shocked when God does not do what we want him to do. At first, we hear that Lazarus was sick. Obviously, Lazarus was in some sort of distress. Mary and Martha would not have sent word of their brother's condition if it wasn't perceived as life-threatening. You see, the name Lazarus, Lazarus means whom God helps. This was the personal friend of Jesus. There are those who teach and believe that all sickness can be attributed to some sin in our lives. Don't miss this now. If you're sick, then you have messed up somewhere. If your illness is serious, then you have messed up big time. The friends of Job ascribed to this school of theology. They said before Job and, and urged him to, to fess up. The truth was, however, Job's calamity and illness had nothing to do with sin. God had allowed the devil to touch him. So to prove his love and devotion to this God. Trials are ordained, my brothers and sisters, by God. For our good to prove us and supply in our lives and our faith that which is lacking. Job 23 and 10 say, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he had tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. Peter said much of the same thing in 1 Peter 1 and 7. He said that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. But much of the problem with Christianity, my brothers and sisters, is that we give too much power and oftentimes praise to the devil. This is why most churches no longer have devotional service. Devotional service turn into giving the adversary power that he does not need. The devil tried to stop me from coming. Did not feel well this morning. Nothing but the devil. Very rarely say a word about God. The devil gave me a flat tire on my way to church. There are simply some things that happen in our life, no matter how uncomfortable it is, ordained and sanctioned by God. But notice the response of Jesus in verse 4 as we walk down this text. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Jesus was clear when he said this sickness. The Lord had a promise, a purpose in this illness, and it wasn't intended to the end of Lazarus' permanent departure. Lazarus would die. And God will allow it so to accomplish his purpose. Jesus said this was all happening for the glory of God. One of the most amazing verses in the Bible, verse 6, which says that when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he spent two days longer in the same place where he was. 
Imagine that. He deliberately, help me, Holy Spirit. He deliberately waited two more days before he came to them. But when he got there, we know the results of his coming. His delay in answering their call did not mean a denial of their call. Jesus came late, but he was still right on time. God always has our best interests at heart. But he acts according to his own agenda, his own timetable, not ours. Jesus had a purpose in waiting to come to Bethany, where Mary and Martha were. You see, the death of Lazarus was set the stage for the last and the greatest of miracles performed by Jesus before his passion. Jesus would arrive in Bethany at his own home and raise his friend from the dead in a spectacular display of his power. At the raising of Lazarus from the dead, many would believe, many would trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Jesus said that the sickness and death of his friend would not only bring glory to God, but that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Just like some of us, my brothers and sisters, we too place limits on what God can do. But we must imagine when Jesus showed up after three days, the sisters of Lazarus as well as the crowd, they understood nothing. There was nothing that Jesus could do at that point. Now there already have been six miracles in John's gospel alone. Turning water to wine, healing of the nobleman's son, restoring the impotent man, multiplying the loaves and the fishes, Walking on the water, carrying the man born blind. Six miracles. Now here comes number seven. And if God uses seven, it's the perfect number. Then this is the climatic miracle. But there are some problems here, my brothers and sisters. The people don't believe <laughs> that there is anything that Jesus can do. After three days in the grave, Things begin to break down in the body. After three days in the grave, all hope is lost. Someone even says, surely his body stinking by now. Jesus, we are just glad you finally were able to show up. Why does God wait so long to answer our urgent problem? Help me, Holy Spirit. This is where I want to taxi to the terminal right long in here. We have emergencies as human beings, and God just waits. I just don't understand sometimes why God doesn't just snap his finger, come when we want him to come. We're back here in Bethany praying, and Jesus is out there doing what he wants to do. He doesn't come. You pray over and over, and nothing happened. Mary and Martha, they waited. Their brother got worse and worse. They waited some more. And I think they said, Lazarus, just hold on. If you just hold on, help me, Holy Spirit, Jesus, he'll be here any minute. He's coming. I know he's coming. He would not come. But Lazarus finally lost consciousness. And finally, the battle was over. And he died. And I can just picture Mary and Martha saying, why does this happen? Jesus healed whole town, loads of people. And he can't even come here and heal the one that he loved. He could have saved our brother. He was only 20 miles away. We know where he is. He had the message and he didn't come. This is a hard lesson to learn. No one likes to wait. We want what we want from God when we want it. But however, it is in our times of loneliness 
loss, pain, and sorrow, that we are driven to the very heart of God. God's timing is not our timing. It's designed to increase our capacity for him. It's designed to sharpen our sensitivities and our understanding for him. It's designed to temper our spiritual lives so that we may become channels of his grace and mercy to others. This message this morning, my brothers and sisters, is for those of you that are going through something. You need to understand that it's not the devil, but God designed what you're going through and using it for his glory. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, this sickness, not that previous sickness that you had, not that previous surgery, not that other bad report that you received, but this one, this one here is designed for his glory. You may not be going through a sickness today, but as I stand here today, I can tell, I can still hear Jesus saying, this one. I know you've been through some. You've been through some storm in your life. But this one, I know if you had some trials along the way, but this one. But what are you going through right now? I'm talking about this one. Not yesterday's storm. Not yesterday's problem. But this one. This one was designed for God's glory. That is why Paul said we go from glory to glory to glory. That problem that you are going through right now, that issue that you have been praying over for a long time, that person you've been praying for, this one was designed that God may get to glory. You're trying to figure this out. You're trying to tell God how to do it and how to fix it. This is not about you. It's not about me. Looking bad or looking good or what others think. This one is for God's glory. I know you've been waiting a long time, but this time, this is one for Jesus. You see, he came down through a 42 generation, doing nothing but good, healing the sick, raising the dead, making the lame to walk, the dumb to talk, feeding 5,000 with two fishes and five barley loaves, turning water to wine, turning pimps into preachers, Gamblers in the deacon, prostitutes in the missionary, giving sight to the blind. Tabernacle here, 33 and a half years, took up an old rugged cross, went out on a hill called Carrie. He just didn't walk up that hill, a place called Skull. They whooped him up the hill. They nailed his hand to the cross. They nailed his feet on the cross. He said, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men, not some men. I'll draw all men unto me. But they lifted my Savior up. They stretched him wide. They hung him high. He died. He died. Oh, yes, he did. They took him down, put him in Joseph Barber tomb. He stayed there all night Friday, all night Saturday. But the Bible said it was early Sunday morning. He got up. He got up with all power, all power of heaven and earth in his hand. This one, this one is for God's glory. It's not about me. It's not about him. It's not about her. This one is for God's glory. Amen. Mary's baby, God's only begotten son, the baker, the bread of life. Food when I'm hungry. He's the one that supplies my every need. He's a doctor, D. He's a great physician in a sick room. He's the lily of the valley. The rose of Sharon. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the resurrection and the life. He's my way out of no way. When you think you don't have a way, just look under Jesus. He said, I'll never leave you. And I will never 
forsake you. He'll give you strength. I know he will. He's given me strength. He's given me strength. He's given me strength. He'll give you strength. I don't care what the doctors say. He'll give you strength. Whatever it is. He can save you from anything. But it's his choice. For God's glory. Let God be the glory.